Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Joe with Joseph Blake Photography, where we dive deep into the world of photography, gear, and the techniques to help you capture the best shots possible. Today, we're gonna to be exploring a topic that's fundamental to your understanding to cameras and their capabilities. We're gonna be talking about the digital camera sensor. We're gonna look at different types, their differences, pros and cons, which brands are using what. So grab your favorite beverage, get comfy, and let's get into it. So first things first, what exactly is a, what is a camera sensor? In simple terms, the sensor is the part of the camera that captures light and converts it into an image. It's like the digital equivalent of film in an old school camera. The size of the sensor can drastically affect the quality of your photos, the depth of field, low light performance, and even the size and weight of your camera. There are several sensor sizes to consider and each has its own unique characteristics. So let's break down the most common ones that you might come across. So normally you're gonna see full frame sensors, APS-C sensors, micro four thirds, one inch sensors, and smaller. Now there are medium format digital sensors and some even larger, but to be honest, in most camera situations, you're not gonna see a sensor that big, except the Fuji 100 series, <laughs> except for some crazy cameras from Fuji. So let's start talking about full frame sensors. These sensors are equivalent in size to 35 millimeter film. They measure approximately 36 by 24 millimeters. Full frame sensors are the largest that you will commonly find in consumer and most professional cameras. So what are the pros and cons of a full frame sensor? They have superior image quality, they have excellent low light performance, they have great depth of field. On the downside, eh, they're larger which means that normally you're going to have a larger, heavier camera. And they're also normally more expensive. Brands like Sony with the A7 and A9 series, Canon with the EOS R series, Nikon with the Z series, Panasonic with its S series, and Leica with the SL series. These are all examples of brands with full frame cameras. One thing I do wanna say about full frame sensors in, because I, I do get asked, okay, I get that it is better and I see the things that are better, but why are they better? There's a couple of different reasons for that. Think about it this way. The sensor has pixels on it or photo sites. These are the areas on the sensor that collect light and convert it into electronic signals that get turned into the image that you see. So because the fact that the sensor is literally physically larger, those photo sites are normally bigger, which means they can collect more information and especially more light. So in lower light environments, they can get more light, which means you get a sharper, clearer image without as much noise. Additionally, because these sensors are larger, you can put more of these photosites on it or more pixels for a higher resolution sensor without as much of a hit to the potential quality or low light performance of the sensor as you jam more of those photosites onto its surface. And lastly, camera manufacturers can charge more for full frame sensors. They know that the customer for the high end camera is looking for full frame, which means that traditionally they put things like faster readouts, more memory, better processing into cameras that are paired with full frame sensors. Next, let's talk about APS-C. And I get the question, okay, one's called full frame. It's the same frame size as a 35 millimeter frame of film. What does APS-C mean? <laughs> APS-C makes perfect sense in that it means advanced photo system type C. And the C is for classic. So there you go, right? It makes perfect sense. <laughs> APS-C sensors are smaller than full frame sensors. Remember full frame sensors were 36 millimeters or approximately a 35 millimeter equivalent frame size, a, an APS-C sensor is 22 by 15 millimeters traditionally. So they are smaller and they're very popular in both entry level and mid range cameras. Now I mentioned just a moment ago that most manufacturers put all their higher end technology into the cameras that have full frame sensors. Normally you will get at least one camera that will be at the top end of its cameras with APS-C sensors and may borrow some, if not all, of the features from its higher end lineup. But in order to offer a great camera with a good sensor and awesome features at a more 
digestible price. You'll normally see at least one camera at the top end of the APS-C uh, line that will have a lot of these features, but with a smaller sensor. So pros and cons. APS-C cameras are more affordable than full frame. That's the first thing. They are normally cheaper. They're also normally lighter and more compact. They just don't need as much uh, space in the camera body for a sensor that's that much smaller. And because of the fact that the sensor is smaller, yet normally these cameras will still have the same mount or the connection for its lenses, these lenses often are measured and designed to fit on a full frame camera. So if you put a lens that's designed for a full frame camera onto an APS-C, sometimes described as a crop sensor, then you actually get a, a longer reach in a telephoto zoom lens. So normally you can get a little bit more out of your long reach lenses. That leads unfortunately to the same downside, which is if you attach a very wide angle lens that is designed for full frame, like this 14 millimeter zoom lens, this 14 millimeter zoom lens would be about a 22 or 23 on a crop sensor because it will effectively crop in a little bit, which kind of defeats the purpose of a super wide angle lens like this. Some other downsides are that sometimes the image quality and low light performance is a little bit poorer. It's not bad, it's just not as good as the full frame. And again, the reason is they are packing normally more of those photo sites, more of those pixels into that smaller surface area on the sensor. It also normally means that with the smaller sensor size, you don't have as many options for resolution. They don't go as high in the resolution categories. And when they do, honestly, you normally end up with poorer performance in the high resolutions on crop sensors. Additionally, because of the way that most lenses are designed and honestly just the, the math around how light works, your depth of field control is normally less. So that super awesome, creamy, out of focus background look that you get with some lenses is normally only achieved at its highest level on a full frame sensor. On a cropped sensor, you're not gonna get as much of that creaminess. More of the background will be in focus, even with a very fast or wide open lens. Now, all the major brands are making APS-C crop sensors. Sony in their 6000 or their A6000 series, Canon with the EOS M, RIP EOS M, and the Rebel series or the R10, R50, R100 series, the Nikon series, the D500, the Z50, and the Fujifilm X series. There are amazing cameras out there with crop sensors. They are probably what you'll find as the best in terms of cost and performance. They really do an exceptional job for what they cost. And they come with mounts that allow you to invest in the higher end lenses, which means that down the road, if you decide to upgrade your camera to a full frame, you already have all the glass. All right, next we're gonna talk about Micro Four Thirds. Micro Four Thirds sensors measure about 17 by 13 millimeters, making them, again, smaller than APS-C. These sensors are often found in mirrorless cameras, which are far more common these days. But when DSLR was king, most of the cameras that were coming out that were quote unquote mirrorless were initially Micro Four Thirds. Micro Four Thirds cameras come in a variety of sizes, shapes, and configurations. But one thing that's pretty common is that they are very compact. They are very lightweight, but they are still very high quality. They're great for travel. They're great for video and vlogging, great for street photography. They can be a little more inconspicuous when you're looking for something that isn't just a big old camera with a lens attached and all that. There's a lot of advantage to having a smaller camera with a smaller sensor. And there are camera companies out there that make phenomenal glass for the Micro Four Thirds system. There are tons and tons of options out there. But as you get to smaller and smaller sensors, you do end up with lower image quality and lower low light performance as you move from full frame to APS-C to Micro Four Thirds. Also, again, just because of the way the math works with how photons and the glass inside our lenses, it reduces your ability to manipulate the depth of field. 
Panasonic makes the Lumix G series and Olympus has the OMD series, which are both phenomenal camera systems. Next, as we move down the line of sensor sizes, you'll hear about one inch sensors. Normally when you hit that one inch size, that's when you know, all right, we can make some really great images out of this. It's gonna be bigger than a smartphone. You're gonna be able to get some decent low light performance, great color. There's a lot more option at one inch. That seems to really be the sweet spot for knowing, okay, am I doing good stuff? Like where can we get to with this sensor? And they're traditionally found in higher end compact cameras and camcorders. They measure about 13.2 by 8.8 millimeters. They're extremely compact. And for the size, you do get great image quality. And there are some great cameras on the market that have advanced features and fast autofocus, even with only a one inch sensor. Also seeing lots of other kind of camera configurations coming into the market where one inch has been a marketing focus for them. GoPros, drones from DJI in the last few years have all been hitting the market with one inch sensors or larger. The downside of course, lower low light or limited low light performance and less depth of field control. The Sony RX100 series, the Canon GX7, GX5, X series, and the Panasonic Lumix LX series all have one inch sensors. Now, lastly, we have smaller sensors out there. Uh, one over 1.3 is another number that you might see or one over 1.5, one over two. These are all sensor sizes that we traditionally find in more dedicated hardware. So not in cameras that you would necessarily uh, buy except for older point and shoots. And those might not necessarily be purchased or you might not be buying those for the sake of image quality. It might just be for form factor, might have a retro feel or look, uh, or it might be that you want something that is very small. But more often than not, when you come across something that's smaller than one inch in a camera situation, you're normally going to be looking at a smartphone. And smartphone cameras are, well, they're a little different than normal cameras for a couple of reasons. Primarily the fact that while they are quite small, the companies that make them like Apple or Google or Samsung are putting an amazing amount of engineering into both the lenses and the processors that go about working on the images that you produce. An iPhone or a Samsung Galaxy phone will take numerous images and piece them together and do all sorts of complex analysis on a very powerful chip that is in your phone. And that really differentiates them that even though it's only a very small sensor size compared to full frame, they can do amazing things with them. And they can also, in some instances, fake the depth of field control. So sometimes you actually get images that look like they should have been out of a larger camera, but they weren't. They came out of a very small sensor that was in your phone. So they are extremely compact. They can be very affordable. They're convenient, especially for casual photography, but the image quality can be limited unless it's tied to a very high performance phone system. Low light performance can be pretty bad with these cameras. And outside of, again, outside of manipulation with within the processing of the phone, depth of field isn't something you traditionally get with sensors of this size. So most smartphone brands, again, Apple, Samsung, Google, are using sensors smaller than one inch, action cameras like GoPro, Osmo, that sort of stuff, and your very compact point and shoots like power shots and cyber shots. Okay, so there you have it. That is an overview of the most common digital sensor sizes, their pros and cons, brands and, and models that you can get them in. And understanding sensor sizes can help you make a more informed decision when you're looking at your next camera depending on your photography needs, depending on your budget. So if you're out there looking for the most professional looking image quality, or you're a hobbyist that wants something compact and affordable, there's options out there for you at every level. And if you found this video helpful, please make sure to give it a thumbs up, give it that like, share it with friends and family who might be in the market looking for cameras. All the gear that I use is down in the description. So if you wanna look at the stuff that I'm using, please take a look there. And once you're done checking that out, go ahead and hit subscribe and hit the bell so that you know when I put out new videos where I'm doing photo tips, gear reviews, news about the industry, and going on photo adventures. Thanks for watching, have a great time shooting, and I will see you in the next one.